My fellow Vincentians, our brothers and sisters of the Caribbean archipelago, and those in the diaspora community, today, August 1st, I invite you to join me and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as we commemorate the 187th anniversary of the proclamation of the end of centuries of enslavement of Africans on the continent and the people of African descent in our region. Emancipation Day is seen as one of the most significant commemorations in our history. It is a celebration of freedom and liberation from a system of oppression and servitude. Slavery was the most reprehensible chapter in our history. Our people fought a long and intense battle so our generation can exist as free people to decide our destiny. Today, we breathe the air of freedom thanks to our ancestors. Whoever closes his eyes to the past becomes blind to the present. We must remember never to forget the struggles of our ancestors in their quest for our freedom. They endured centuries of servitude and fought for some of the basic rights we enjoy today. It is for this reason why our call for reparations for native genocide and the enslavement of African peoples remain relevant and current to date. Our ancestors, though enslaved, never got weary in their struggle for freedom. We owe it to our ancestors to become the best citizens we can be. It is our responsibility to use our hard-fought freedoms for the advancement of our people. Today, let us embrace the spirit of emancipation. Let us continue the legacy of our ancestors, calling on their spirit of resolve resilience, perseverance. These qualities define who we are as a people in our quest for a continual development of our modern Caribbean civilization. Let us remember Emancipation Day today. Join me in celebrating Emancipation Day. Happy Emancipation Day. God bless you.
embracing our past and forging ahead in the future is an appropriate theme as we commemorate that day 183 years ago when we began our life as a free people. Now prior to this day, our four parents were classified as chattel slaves. That is, they were linked with the buildings, the property, the animals, and not as human beings. And um, in that case, they were denied their humanity. Now, emancipation for me is the most significant milestone in our journey as a people. I believe that the refusal over the years for our people to reflect on emancipation because we were ashamed of being slaves and also because of the way it was taught in schools denied us an opportunity to understand the positives that came out of it. Now regarding the positives I would say that we survived during the period of slavery with our humanity intact. Our slaves, our four parents built this country for a number of years during slavery, well, between 1805 and 1829, apart from Jamaica, we were the largest producer of sugar in the Caribbean. And uh, around the time of emancipation, the planters boasted of the amount of money they put into the British Treasury and also the amount of shipping. And they provided a nursery for cement. But the contribution was really made not by the planters, but by the slaves themselves. The other important thing in terms of understanding the positives is that we participated in our own emancipation. When they were debating the Emancipation Bill in Britain in 1833, news came from St. Vincent that there was unrest in the Carib country estates. Now, this came after you had had the revolution in Haiti, there was a revolt in Barbados in 1816, in 1823 in Demerara, and 1831 in Jamaica. So when they heard the news, some people felt that it is either we emancipate from above or emancipation would come from below. But in any case, emancipation would come. So that the unrest in the Carib country came at a very critical time when they were debating the act. And... Um, it is important to point out where the positives are concerned that education for us in the Caribbean only began after slavery because during slavery there was no need for an educated black population. What they wanted were sugarcane workers and that's what they got. But surprisingly enough, well not surprisingly enough, what, what is a positive is that 180, 183, well even before 183 years, the Caribbean has produced three Nobel laureates, two from St. Lucia and one from Trinidad. And that, that is marvelous given the fact that education only started after emancipation. So to me, reflecting on our past provides us with an understanding of ourselves, how we came to where we are, and that as a free people, despite the obstacles, we became known internationally for our route, for instance, so that in the international community, Owea and Fancy were well known for the our route, and St. Vincent also produced the finest sea island cotton. And most of this our route and cotton was produced by small farmers and peasants. So I'm saying that knowledge of our past and an awareness of the obstacles which we had to overcome will provide us not only with an understanding of ourselves, but in my mind, a, a mental framework which could help to push us forward and guide that movement forward. We do not live in a vacuum. The past is part of what and who we are. And it is, in my view, the anchor that stabilizes us and guides us on the way forward. So to me, this is what emancipation means as we reflect on it. It is the most important milestone in our history. And as we reflect on it, we see not only the brutality, but we see some positives that came out of it. And we were able in 183 years to build our communities where we were a free people and independent people. And we need to hold on to this understanding of the past in order to guide our way forward.
My Fathers by E. Roy Caetano. Drums of my fathers, rumbling in my bones. Drums of my fathers, beating in my mind. Drums of my fathers, capturing my soul. Words of my fathers, tumbling from my mouth. Drums of my fathers, of my grandfathers, of my ancestors, drumming in my psyche. Drums of my fathers, beat, drum, beat, beat on, drum on and on. My going from a frame and my current being born stingle. Keeping time with the reverberating sounds of the hollow trunk, of the hollow trunk whose roots reach deep into the hills and the bays and the streams and the souls of Africa. Reach into the banks and the waters and the heart and the mind of the Amazon, of the Orinoco. My hybrid body shakes and sways and rocks and communicates with the blur of wrinkled hands still sore and scarred and the manacles and cuffs and chains got pulled and bullets and cross-shaped sword that transverse the Atlantic calling at West African stations and Palm Island studs of the golden antelopes and let the antelope skin that captured the clatter and the thunder of the hoofbeat of the herds in the African plains. And the rumble and the thunder of the jungles and the falls of the Amazon. I stretched, taught, having taken the beating and the pounding. And my spirit and my voice will not be quieted, will not be muffled, for I am the hallowed, hallowed, hallowed trunk, and the hills and the bays and the streams and the soil of Africa, and the banks and the waters and the heart and the mind of the Amazon and the Orinoco and the wrinkled, callous hands, dragged, dragged across the Atlantic and dumped on the golden stars and shores of the Caribbean waters. Yet you must know, I was here before that. I was here before, before the pale of faces came and all the music, jukebox blaring, hymn song to Mary and the Queen's English. Shall not quiet the drums, the drums of my fathers, rumbling in my bones, capturing my mind, drums of my fathers. My fathers tumbling, tumbling from my mouth. Jumps, jumps of my fathers, of my grandfathers and ancestors, jumping in my psyche. Souls of my fathers, jump, beat, jump, beat, beat on, jump on, and on, and on, and on, and on. When the British came here in 1763, the Kalinago and the Garifuna fought for their land. They fought for their right to run their own country as they see fit. They reached out in friendship with others but that friendship was abused and a colonial state was, a, was established. The British remade this country. They brought in Anglo-Saxons from Britain. 
the Cardotti War of Genocide against the Kalinago and the Garifuna, getting rid of two thirds of the 10,000 or so persons estimated at the time when they arrived, indigenous peoples, either through native genocide or through the deportation to Baliso and then subsequently to the Bay of Honduras. And then between 1764 and 1807, the British brought to this country over 55,000 Africans whom they enslaved, captured and enslaved. At the end of slavery in 1838, there were 22,000 slaves, men, women, and children. And then when they ran out of labor for the plantation economy, they went to Madeira and got about 2,000 Madeirans, Portuguese, between 1845 and 1850 as indentured servants. And then between 1850 and the 1860s, just over a thousand quote-unquote liberated Africans were brought here in a position of subjection, though not of slavery. And from 1861 to 1880, about 2,500 persons from India were brought as indentured servants. It meant, therefore, that within a period of just over a hundred years, the British had remade St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And all the land which belonged to the Kalinago and the Garifuna in 1764, those lands were deemed to belong to the British crown. All of it. And during the guerrilla war by the indigenous people against the British, the British made it illegal for them to own land, for the originators of the land to own land. And at emancipation, the British slave owners and plantation owners were paid compensation. And those who worked, the Africans, who had been brought here as slaves, they continued a kind of wage slavery. And then I mentioned the, ind the indentured servants, propertyless also. So that the seeds of 1935 uprising, the seeds were laid from as early as the colonization of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the, established, the establishment of colonial hegemony. And of course, people will resist. There was resistance from the Kalinago and the Garifuna. There was resistance in 1848 by the former slaves. Incidentally, when they protested across this country in 1848, I don't know if you read that in your history books, but there are a lot of history which is not before you, you know. You know, in 1848, 
The British said, these protesters are influenced by communism. Well, in 1848, that was the year that Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. Well, it's not like now. When you write something in New York, it's known immediately at the community college through electronic means. But somehow, Karl Marx in 1848 influenced the Africans who were former slaves. In the same way that when Ralph started to question colonialism and imperialism, they say he's a communist, as though I have a mind of my own. Has been like that throughout the ages. Bogeymen and women used to deter progressive people. And there was a big protest in Monbentic in 1861-62. And then persons of Indian descent, dozens of them marched from Argyle to Kingston, barefooted and in rags to protest their condition as indentured servants. For the API, I am Yinka Goodluck. Solid as a rock, solid as a, solid as a, yeah. Solid as a rock, solid as a, boy. As we commemorate Emancipation Day, I would like to bring greetings on behalf of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this gives us yet another opportunity to reflect on our rich heritage and our history and ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. Freedom is a beautiful thing, and we've come a long way since emancipation. May we forever continue to be a free people. Uh, and in the words of the great Calypsonian, Papi, no man is free until all men are free everywhere. Let freedom reign, and let us continue to love and respect each other as a human race. Thanks to the rhythmic sound of our African and Kalinago ancestry. Our Garifuna heritage.
what emancipation means to me. Until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned. That until they are no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation and until the color of a man's skin is no more significant than the color of his eyes. Racism was the cause of slavery. What comes to my mind when I think of emancipation is the unique history of Yorubé, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Emancipation to us in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is different to any other island, country, region in this Western Hemisphere. What comes to my mind is the slogan, Reparations Now. I want to refer just back in time a little to 1791 and the Haitian slaves rebelled and revolted and the first free black nation in the West was born. In 1795, the Right Honorable Paramount Chief Joseph Chatouillet died on March 14th at Dorset Hill. In 1796, 580 Garifuna were exiled from Urumé. Their navel strings are buried right here. 2080 arrived on Rautan in an intended act of genocide carried out by the British government on a tiny island state in the Caribbean Sea. 37 years later, as William Wilberforce of England was dying, the British abolished the slave trade. 30 years later, as a direct result of civil war, the almighty United States of America emancipated their slaves. We deserve reparations for the attempted genocide. We demand reparations for the life lost in the so-called Carib Wars. In 2001, UNESCO proclaimed the Garifuna culture to be a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. The exiled rob intentions of their language, their food, their forms of worship, and other forms of entertainment, and most significantly, a psychic attitude of resistance and self-reliance. Today, for emancipation, what is on my mind is reparations now.
This piece I am going to do for you is in the load black, natural, and beautiful. From the palms of my master's hands, he created a natural and mystical phenomenon. From the sole of my feet to the crown of my head, I take keen observation and see a masterpiece of his handiwork. My skin is black and it makes me feel glad. My appreciation for blackness is unsurpassed. Awesome is the way I look. I thank God for making me black. My physical structure transcends might, strength, and power. The pulse of my muscles beat as fast as the rhythm of an African drum. When I speak, the tone of my voice echoes like thunder from distant yonder. I love black. I reflect black. No one can alter that. I love black. Think black, and that's a fact. It is a good feeling to be black. It is a good feeling to be black. I am black and proud. I am black and proud. Right now we're black. Natural hair or your hair in itself was it identified you as a, a person so there are certain you know Africa is made up of a lot of ethnic tribes um, so you ethnic groups rather so you would be associated to a specific groups whether you are from the Bantu tribe or the Zulu tribe or so on so when it comes to hair what I would have discovered was that hair was a form of identity so i would be able to look at you and say oh you belong to this particular ethnic group i can look at you and say oh you are you you are this age or are you married or not you know it carried a lot of layers the hair itself carried a lot of layers um it had a lot of meaning um it was hair more or less identified who a black woman was or even a black man it, it, it's not only limited to just being a black woman but also it, it extends to a black man so you, your person itself had a lot to do with hair even before there was any form of interaction with the europeans during the slavery period um what i understood was that there were laws in place because the the, the black woman's hair was it was an attraction for the white men. So me, the men, because they came with all kind of fancy hairstyles. If you, even if you research black hair in Africa right now, you're going to find all those fancy hairstyles. Of course, they had all of these fancy things and they, naturally they would be inquisitive. So men, most of the white men were attracted to the hair, the, the crown of the black woman. So they ensure that they implemented laws and measures to tame the hair of the black woman. Um, I think in America, in the United States, they had a law called the Tignan Law, around 1786, I think, um, that was passed, where you had to tame your hair. You know, it's either you shave it, or you find some way of ensuring that your hair is not out there. It is not um, doing too much, because it's ca causing so much attraction specifically from the black community. So we are moving on now to the 70s when we have the upsurge of the civil rights movement and the black power movement. Earlier, we would have heard from uh, Marcus Garvey who would have pushed the idea of black beauty. So he believes strongly that you being this black little girl is okay. You carrying the hair that you were naturally born with, it is okay because black is beautiful. So uh, there was this intense push um, on, for the black community that you are beautiful. You did not have to conform to what um, the, 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 the 
accepted way of what the, the white supremacist um, thought beauty was. It was, not, it was time for us now to embrace what our beauty is and what it entails. And then we move on to the civil rights movement slash the black power movement, where then again, we know of the Afro, right? And the Afro was a big thing. Um, the Afro showed militancy. It was associated with um, rebellion. It was associated with um, empowerment. Um, it has a, had a lot of layers, and it still does have a lot of layers to it. So um, while there are a lot of political, there are a lot of political um, issues that was associated with the Black Power Movement and the Civil Rights Movement, there was also the cultural aspect, which where the hair falls into. And um, they pushed a lot. We had like um, Nina Simone, she carried her puff, you know, um, those, black, those females in the Black Power uh, movement, they would have um, carried their puffs because it was, it was a resistance, a form of resistance, using the hair to resist. And I bring it home to St. Vincent because that's part of my study as well, my research as well. Um, in the 70s, when we, have, when we had our own Black Power movement here, there was a tendency for us as well, we adopted the, the, the whole idea of carrying our hair natural, carrying the puffs and so on. So, um, all in horn, all, most of the females who were associated with the movement would have carried, um, I think Renrick Rose, wife, all of these females would have engaged in carrying their crown a specific way, which, is, which was the Afro puff. And I remember reading a piece of evidence where there was this barber and he was saying because at that time he wasn't making any money because everybody carrying them puff male and female are carrying them puff and then he had a lot of derogatory terms um to speak as it relates to the hairstyles that the black those who were part of the movement was carrying at that time while growing up i had what they call nice hair and you can look at my hair and a lot of people will comment and comment to me and say, "Oh, you have nice hair." And because I'm woke now, I'm like, "So what is nice hair? All oh, those curly things and whatever." But as a child, I grew up. My hair changed um, as I aged, but I grew up with hair that you use the comb and you make a curl. That is how straight my hair was because my mother is straight Indian, my father is African. So. Um, I grew up where I'm, my hair is always and then uh, when I went off to study and then I started to understand what my hair is and who my hair is when it comes to me then I took the decision to um, return to my, my natural roots which I did and I have done I have been natural for more than eight years um, I've returned to and I've never ever 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 and I will never ever ever um, go back to processing my hair. I couldn't understand and it's after now while during the process I couldn't understand why I couldn't scratch my hair before I go and relax my hair. I couldn't understand why I had to stay under this heated thing to have my hair cool down and then my ears are burning. I mean just couldn't understand why I have got you all of this torture you know just to get my hair looking a specific way a, a way in which yeah like a way in which society accepts because if I put my hair in one, everything I call back up. You understand? So I couldn't understand, you know, why I had to just be carrying my hair straight when my hair is really unnatural. It is not, look at my hair, it's curly. You know, so, um, and the reality is we're still fighting that war today. What if a black girl knew? What if a black girl knew that she can only be desired by others only if she desires herself? And that beauty is not a shade, it's a mindset. And the best indicator of this is self-confidence. What if a black girl knew that her lips are plumped and beautiful, that she does not need to hold them in. She does not need to depend on Kylie Jenner to make her lips an attainable thing. But what if a black girl knew? There is no such thing as a perfect nose. Because a nose is not intended to be perfect. It was meant to breathe. And if you breathe, black girl, you succeed. So what if a black girl knew 
that to be ratchet is a culture defined by black goddesses whose weave can be any color and speech can be any kind of cross slang to misplaced grammar. Such creativity, so why does it matter? Slangs do not need to be spoken to generate pain for our culture. But what if a black girl knew not to be bitter, that like her father, her sons were molded by black hands and what she sees in her father, she will eventually see in her man. So if bitter is the molding, then how sweet can be the man. If bitter is the black girl, then how sweet can be the plan. What if a black girl knew? That her rubies were hidden in the sand. That her hair is finely refined wool and not a fiber on her hair is the opposite of cool. But it reflects on the outside, the struggle on the inside, where the natural we take to straighten the hate for ourselves, we project upon ourselves. But what if a black girl knew that history record her as the most scorned after her bosom was range of that wouldn't dry, that her body was a magnet to worldwide wonder and the jealousy was so great that it polluted the perception of a black girl until 1600 years later. Now what if a black girl knew that she was the same creature that drove slave masters from the wicked hatred right down to love but the waves in her figure eight billion dollar figure in the bank accounts of the coke corporation by the shape launched by her figure eight same figure eight figure out black girl figure out the figures match the glass of social degrading delivered to the black girl's demise Check your figures, media ratios, 1,000 Caucasians on the red carpet, only two black girls can make the cut, and they wonder why we don't grow. Let me guess, because the more dark girls knew the past of a young girl, but what if a black girl knew that life is what you make of it and opportunities are what you take from it. There will be no female black president if no black girl wants to become it. Today marks a very significant and important day in our history as people of African descent. Marks the 183 years of emancipation from slavery, a terrible holocaust that our forefathers had to undergo many years ago. Now many persons would think that our history started from the emancipation of slavery, but I always like to go back, a little back when we came from glorious people, a glorious continent that was ravished, plundered, um, where our forefathers, our ancestors were robbed of their dignity. Um, just because of the greed of many persons around the world. Um, in this case, Spain, Belgium, France, England. They all capitalized on what we call the worst holocaust in our history, the trade of our black brothers and sisters. It is a time when I think we all as black persons, as persons of African descent, must reflect on our history, where we came from as a people. So to see where we are going in the future. A people as Marcus Garvey say without knowledge of their past is like a tree without roots. And it is very important for us to instill in our young persons a joy and a love for our history. Love our thick lips, love our face. And, and there's some things, some trends that are happening now which I would also like to speak to is the trend of trying to lighten our skins. You know, trying to change our hair, trying to change our look. And we have to know many of these things that we are trying to change, the Europeans are actually trying to gain. So the European wants the big bottoms. They want the, the big breasts. They want the thick lips. You know, they want darker skin. So that's why they go about tanning. Because we have melanin in our skin. And this skin is also very protective for us from the UV rays. So it's very important to cherish the skin that you're in. I would like to encourage our young people to research their history get a deeper connection with your Africanness. As we commemorate this day, I would like to pay tribute to the Rastafari community who has been a foundational pillar 
in the message of Africanness, in Pan-Africanism. And I would say I am standing firmly on the shoulders of the Rastafari movement to be able to be solicited or requested to speak on a program like this. And I give thanks for the strong and continued works of the Rastafari movement to try to uplift our race, try to encourage our African culture to drumming, to the promotion of our African ideology, um, promoting Marcus Garvey, promoting Kwame Nkrumah, and all the great African leaders around the world. So I give thanks for this love and support, and I hope that we can continue to build from strength to strength. Looking forward to continued work, and I as well would like to say, um, congratulations for this program on behalf of the Ministry of Culture, but also to give a plug that you need to do a little bit more. You know, it's a time when you have to see how programs, not barely money intensive, but see how we can get out to the masses and encourage little communities to organize activities. I know we are COVID restricted now, but for the future, you know, I hope that we'll be able to celebrate more in the different communities and have more education to uplift our black race. Thank you very much. Thank you. With a strong concentration of people of Afro-descendants in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Department of Culture, and by extension, the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has always been proud to be associated with everything and anything of Africa and of Afro-descent. Thus, most of the programs that the department has undertaken engage or embrace our Afrocentricity. We celebrate our Afro-descendants all year round. But within this year, but within the year, special foresight are placed on the different months, like Heroes and Heritage, Emancipation Month, and Dance Month, to embrace and celebrate our people of Afro-descent. During these months, we learn remember and ponder the distant past. We honor our heroes and through cultural events and indigenous people celebrations, we breathe life and we create the awakening in, in and of our Afro-African heritage. In embracing our past, which for, will forever be an important part of our life, we may remember the hurt we may remember the pains, but it is those challenges that will help to mold us into strong and vivacious and conscious and determined individuals that we are now. It is those challenges, the horrid stories, the hard lifestyle, the pressures of the enemies, that have enabled us into the resilient people that we are now. So our past become an important part of our lives when we embrace it. Freed from the shackles of shattered slavery, free at last, freedom, freedom for me, freedom for you, freedom for all of us, Freedom from the bondage of slavery, we are free. The chains have been broken. The chain has been broken. And we are grateful as we pay homage to our forebears for the legacy they have left so that we could have this freedom and liberty that we have now. Where will we be without them? Will we have been able to be so privileged now? Shall they not have fought and toiled 
and labored in order to lay the foundation that we continue to build on. Let the celebration begin. Let the celebrations continue. Happy Emancipation Day. Solid as a rock, solid as a rock, solid as a rock.